worship here at Neils Creek Baptist Church this morning. So glad that uh, you all were not deterred by the cold rain and the icicles. Uh, I can see that the organ side loves Jesus a whole lot more than the piano side. I feel like you guys ought to just move over there and everybody huddle together to keep warm this morning. If you get chilly, you have my permission to go across the aisle. But we do want to say uh, thank you for being here uh, this morning. And we certainly are all praying that warmer weather is to come. And it looks like that is the case for the week ahead. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we say a special word of welcome to you. We're so glad that you are here and worship with us. We're honored by your presence. I hope that when you came in this morning, someone offered you a visitor's cup that looks uh, just like this one. Uh, if you didn't get one on the way in, they're available on the information table as you exit the sanctuary this morning. That information table is over on your right-hand side out in the vestibule. We have some of these uh, on the table there. We also have some that are in tote bags. You're welcome to take either one. It has a lot of good information inside that cup about our church and a little bit about who we are here at Neils Creek Baptist, and we'd love to have you be a part of our family of faith. Also, if you're worshiping with us for the very first time, we'd love for you to look in the pew rack in front of you where the offering envelopes are located, and right in front of those, you'll see some rectangular visitor's cards that say welcome on the front of it. If you would just take one of those cards and flip it over and fill out that information and drop it in the offering plate when that's passed a little later in the service. We'd love to have a record of your visit, get to know you a little bit better. I have just a few uh, announcements to go over with us uh, this morning. You'll see that this afternoon, we do have some events coming up this afternoon and evening in the life of our church. Uh, the adult choir will practice. They'll have cantata practice for their Easter cantata music at 345. Uh, church staff will have their meeting at 5.30. And then tonight we'll have a Southern Gospel group called Men of Faith. They will be here uh, in concert tonight at 7 o'clock, and we will be taking up a love offering for them. Uh, you will see uh, also a number of uh, meetings uh, taking place this week, and our regular Wednesday night activities will be on schedule uh, next Sunday. Remember, daylight savings time, the time will change. Uh, so remember to spring forward. And uh, Brotherhood, you will gather at uh, 7.30 for your breakfast and meeting in the fellowship hall. And then uh, a whole list of things that will be taking place here in the coming weeks. So do be aware of those things. Do we have any other announcements that we need to be aware of before we look at our prayer list together? Okay, let's open our prayer list and look together at our prayer uh, topics. We do want to remember our uh, ski trip, uh, the youth ski trip. They'll be coming back, our youth group coming back from the ski trip this morning. So pray for safe travel for them today. Uh, as far as I know, there's been no injuries. Nobody has fallen off the mountain that I'm aware of. So just pray that everything, uh, everybody gets back safe and sound. And then uh, let's remember to continue to pray for uh, all of the emergency workers, even the power crews that have been out uh, in this rough weather recently. Uh, they have to go to work, and they are, uh, they are serving and protecting our, our, the people of our community when the rest of us don't have to be out in it, hopefully. And so let's just remember them and their families and the sacrifices that they make. Uh, just a few... Uh, updates on the prayer list phil farrell is doing much better now he has gone um, uh, with Kay to florida to see uh, Kay's mother miss cogburn who is hospitalized there uh, i received a report this morning that miss agnes mcleod is doing much better uh, and she thanks all of us for our prayers on behalf of her uh, many of you know uh, roy debrand a former interim pastor here uh, roy and uh, his wife, Carolyn, now live in Henderson, uh, but he found out this week that he has a 95% blockage in his carotid artery. That's the artery uh, in your neck, and so he's going to be having surgery at Duke on the 11th of March to have that uh, repaired. Uh, so we definitely want to remember uh, Mr. Roy in our prayers. You will also see uh, several uh, more uh, folks there that have been added under family and friends, and we want to remember all of those uh, listed there on our prayer list uh, i do have a few uh two names to mention under sympathy um, our hearts go out uh, to karen bass and her family her father mr benny ray passed away 
yesterday uh, morning he had been in critical care at Chapel Hill for uh, some time and uh, he passed away yesterday morning and so let's remember uh, Karen and her family certainly in our prayers uh, also uh, Tommy Matthews cousin Danny Altman passed away recently and uh, Tommy asked that we would add that family uh, to the prayer list and the service for him um, is today and I think uh, also uh, Robert Wood's brother Aubrey Wood Jr. passed away earlier uh, this week and so let's remember Robert's family as well are there other prayer requests or praise reports that would come before the body of Christ this morning David Baker, and that is uh, one of the sing the guys in the group that's coming tonight. He may not be here, but he's got a substitute, a good fellow to take his place if he doesn't make it. Okay. Any others? Okay, if not, then let's bow as we go to the Lord for a time of prayer. Good and gracious God, it is always good to be in your presence and to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you, the true and living God. We thank you today, Lord, that you saw fit for us to wake up this morning and to get out of bed under our own power, our own strength. We thank you, Lord for the multitude of blessings, Lord, that are all around us, from warm houses to uh, cars that are full of gas to get us here, to nice clothes that we can wear, and a convenient place to worship you in safety without worry uh, for anyone that might persecute us while we're in this place. Lord, we pray that we would not miss those blessings, that we would not take those things for granted, but that, Lord, we might truly cherish this time to come into your house and to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray today, Lord, that as we journey through this season of Lent, that you would continue to make each of us acutely aware of the ways that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that you would make us aware of the, the brokenness in our own lives, those places where we need to come before you and repent and turn from wicked ways and humble ourselves and seek your face that, Lord, you might heal our community, heal your church on this earth, heal our country, and heal our world. Lord, we thank you today that we can come giving both our blessings and our burdens before you. For, Lord, you've told us you are the one whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. And, Lord, as we remember these names on our prayer list, Lord, as we remember many situations, many struggles, Lord, we do come with a lot on our heart and our mind. And so, Lord, today I pray that you would allow us to leave this place with a perspective of faith, walking by faith and not by sight. That, Lord, we would allow the goodness of God to overshadow the earthly circumstances that sometimes frustrate us and depress us. Lord, I pray that the joy of the Lord might fill us in this place today. Lord, as we pray that prayer that you taught all your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the tree pen 625, the piano and organ will be playing one time through, 
and the choir is going to sing the first two verses, and we ask that you would join us on three and four. want to huddle together and keep warm. <laughs> Good morning. How are you all? It's a little chilly, isn't it? Yeah, I guess how y'all want to huddle, you may. Um, okay, for this morning, I wanted to share with you some portraits of me that some of my neighbor kids' friends have done for me. What do you think? They're actually pretty cool, aren't they? I love this one because it kind of looks like a goldfish with a pig nose, and yet I'm not insulted by that. So, um, so do you think one might look a little bit better than the other if you were gonna like say which looks the most like me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think because one doesn't and it kind of has a pig nose, I shouldn't put it on the refrigerator? Actually, you've seen this for two and a half years on my, on my wall of art, haven't you? Yeah, because you know what? They're both a gift. And they mean a lot to me that a child who is not my own grandchild took the time to draw a picture of me to give to me. So I, I value these equally and I don't, the stars she put on there, I did not give it five blue stars. Um, she did that, I think, because I'm just, like, sparkly. At least that's what I'd like to think. Um, so, same thing, like, uh, we've got gifts we, we offer God, don't we? All right, we heard Miss Lauren sing two weeks ago on Baptist Women's Sunday. Did it make some of the rest of us feel like we are croaking frogs and perhaps should sing quietly? Maybe. But does God mind? He doesn't mind if we don't. He doesn't even mind if we don't sing on pitch. And he created perfect pitch, so he knows what it should sound like. But God said, you know, the Bible tells us, make a joyful noise. So God loves all kinds of musical gifts. And those of you who've heard me play piano in children's church know that he likes my piano gift, although Furman's gift um, clearly is a little higher level, isn't it? All right, so what, what we're told is not to compare my gift to someone else's gift, I'm told to just offer my gift straight up to him, however, however it comes. And it's going to be the same with you. 
You're going to be in sports, and somebody, they, they have gifted athletes. Somebody can pitch like a mad dog. Some people can hit very well, and some people can catch well, and some can do all three. But does it mean that you shouldn't try out, or you shouldn't go be on a softball team, or you shouldn't shoot baskets if, you, if you're not great? No. We're called to do everything that we do. We're to do it as if it's for God. So even playing basketball and sports can be an offering to God if we're using a gift that he gave to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that even the lady who in her day was called the greatest of sinners, when she gave her gift and broke perfume over Jesus' feet and cried over his feet and wiped his feet dry with her hair, Jesus said she has done the best she could. And that's all that we are called to do, and we thank you for that, Lord. Let us give you always our best in all things at all times, just knowing that in doing that, we're showing you thanksgiving and gratitude for the gifts you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Regardless of how young or old we are, it is evident that God has been present in each of our lives since the beginning of time to present. So let us join together as we sing, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, Hymn 74. Gracious God, we are ever aware of your abundant blessings in our life, blessings of time and treasure and talents. And today, Lord, part of our act of worship is to come before you and to show our love to you, to honor your faithfulness before us by giving back to you just a portion of what you've entrusted to us. Lord, may these monetary gifts, these gifts, Lord, that come sacrificially, may they 
be put to use to bless the church, to bless those in need in our community, to bless the kingdom of God among us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
season of Lent, let's pause just for a moment uh, of silent confession of our sins. Let us pray. Amen. Would you turn with me uh, in your Bible to the book of Lamentations and let's stand together for the reading of our scripture this morning. It comes from Lamentations in the third chapter and we'll be reading just a few verses, verses 31 through verse 36. Lamentations chapter 3 beginning in verse 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. When all the prisoners of the land are crushed underfoot, when human rights are perverted in the presence of the Most High, when one's case is subverted, does the Lord not see it? God bless the reading of Scripture that we might hear and do his word. You may be seated. Well, this morning I think we face two existential crises in our world today. The first one is what color is that dress, really? Is it gold and white or is it blue and black or some other combination of colors? The other, probably a little bit more pressing question, is what do we do with human suffering? Where is God found in human suffering? Uh, what should our response be as Christians, as people of faith, when we ourselves experience suffering situations? And for the next two Sundays, we will be looking at biblical texts and looking at foundational questions of our faith that deal with the issue of human suffering. On February the 15th, of this year the terrorist group that we know as ISIS released a video showing 21 of their henchmen dressed in black standing along the beach of Tripoli and behind they stood behind 21 Egyptian Christian men dressed in orange jumpsuits who were on their knees and in that very spot those 21 ISIS terrorists would brandish sharp knives and simultaneously behead cutting the throats of all 21 of those Christian men, men who were fathers, husbands, sons, brothers. These men were targeted for capture, kidnap, and execution simply because they were Christian. When we see events like this in our world, it troubles us, it offends us, it angers us, and it makes us think. That could be one of our own men. That could be our son our husband, our brother, our father. It makes us think, if we were in their shoes, how would we respond? Would we share the courage of their conviction to die for our faith? Would we be able to share their testimony? Paul put it in these words, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it makes us think and wonder how a God of justice, a God of love, a God of power and might, a God who promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. A God who said he would fight our battles for us. A God who said that no weapon formed against us would prosper. How could such a God allow such killing? It makes us ask the question that the writer of Lamentations asked this morning. Does God not see it? That's our foundational question this morning. Taken from the book of Lamentations which is a book of poetic sorrow that laments the condition of God's people as they are in exile. The theological perspective of the writer of Lamentations is that of a person looking back over their life. He's looking back and he realizes now where Israel went wrong. The writer of Lamentations, in hindsight, has 20-20 vision. And he sees that God's people had turned away from God, that they had worshipped foreign idols, that they had deliberately disobeyed the commands of God. 
And so it's not a struggle for him to understand why this could happen. How foreign invaders would overtake God's people and drive them into exile, drive them from their homes, tear apart their families, make them prisoners of war. The writer of Lamentations understands that this is the fulfillment of many a prophetic warning that Israel had heard through the years. And yet they ignored those warnings. And now they are reaping what their disobedience had sown. The writer of Lamentations doesn't struggle with the fact that this has happened. He can look back and see how it all came to pass. But the thing he uh, struggles with the most is how long it has gone on and how severe the suffering has been. Surely by now God has gotten his point across. Surely now justice has been served for their disobedience. Surely now God's people would fear him and worship God alone. Isn't it past the time that God in his mercy should have relented and rescued his people from this suffering situation? And from the theological dilemma comes that question in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 36. Does the Lord not see it? Does God not see our suffering? Does God not understand how much this hurts? Does God not wish to do something about it? It's a question that we're all bound to ask when we encounter suffering and an unexplainable tragedy in our world. Does God not see it? And the question that we're really trying to get at is this, does God not care? Is God not moved to compassion? Does God not see the need to intervene with justice? Why isn't an all-powerful God who claims to love us unconditionally, why isn't God doing something about this? We hear in the poetry of Lamentations a back-and-forth dialogue that represents the theological struggle for the writer. He's going through this experience trying to make sense of who he knows God to be and yet hold that alongside this very real experience of suffering that he's going through. As a man who has experienced attacks and humiliation and who is now held as a captive prisoner of war, he cannot resolve this contradiction between the confidence that he has in God and the circumstances of his suffering. Hope and despair co-inhabit his world. And we see in his poetry that he goes back and forth between the two. In a few of the verses, he might be a little more hopeful. And then in the next couple of verses, we read and feel the despair that he's going through. In verse 19 of chapter 3, he describes his affliction like a bitter pill that he's had to swallow. And he admits that he is depressed, that his soul is downcast within him. But then in verse 21, he says, This I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassion never fails. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So one minute he's in despair, the next minute he has a little more hope and he's honestly trying to juggle the two competing emotions. He's trying to hold up his idea of who God is while wrestling with the reality of an incredibly difficult and disorienting human experience. Pain and suffering have a way of disorienting us to everything in life that we thought was certain everything we thought we could stand on, every one we thought we could count on, everything we thought we really believed with all our heart. Pain and suffering has a way of disorienting those things, of clouding those judgments. But even in the midst of this struggle, even in the midst of this peculiar combination of doubt and faith, if we look closely at these powerful words from Lamentations, I believe there's some help in answering that foundational question of our faith. Does the Lord not see it? First of all, I would submit to you this morning that the writer of Lamentations recognizes God's providential goodness because he's still alive to tell about it. As we read in verse 22, the writer admits it is because of the Lord's great love that we are not consumed. 
In other words, he is acknowledging that even though God's people are suffering, if it had not been for the fact that God loved them so, they would already be dead. Because God destroyed the world with the flood and God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. If God had truly turned his back completely on his people, they would have already been consumed by death and destruction. And so the writer recognizes that God has not issued a death sentence for his people. If he has seen fit to keep them alive this long, then surely God has a plan and a purpose for this season of suffering while they're in exile. And he believes that God is going to bring them through it eventually, even if it seems like it's already gone on for far too long. Some of you need today need to celebrate the fact that you're still alive. You've been through some suffering. You've had to endure some trials. But by the grace of God, you are still here. By his mercy alone, you were not consumed. You were not overcome by your season of suffering. Does anyone know this morning that you are more than a conqueror because God has blessed you to see another day? You might have been through sickness and surgery. and The devil tried to kill you, but by the mercy of the living God, you got out of bed this morning under your own power, under your own strength. And if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you might not be here today to give him some praise. Second, the writer of Lamentations gives us a word about how to endure situations of suffering while holding on to our faith in God. In verse 24, the writer declares, The Lord is my portion, therefore will I wait on Him. Turn to your neighbor and say, Wait on God. Wait on God. He's saying, If God has allowed me to live this long, then surely the deliverance of God is coming. And I recognize that I have to be patient and I have to wait on the Lord, understanding that there is a day that is coming when I will see how this all fits together into his plan. He gives us a word pointing us to endurance when it comes to outlasting a suffering situation. Look with me in your Bible at verses 27 through 30 of chapter 3. The writer says, It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. That's a difficult word to hear, isn't it? That sometimes, no matter how much faith we have, no matter how much we have done for the Lord, no matter how good of a life we have tried to live, that there still may be seasons where we simply have to bear a yoke of suffering. And it's in those times that we are utterly humble. When we sit in silence, not having the words to say, when we put our face to the ground, pleading with the Lord in prayer, when we don't have the strength or the energy left to even fight back when life seems to slap us in the face. That's not an easy word. That's not something that you or I sign up for when we decide to follow Christ. But the reality is that seasons of suffering will come to some of us who are Christians. And sometimes the best we can do is simply to endure. And we endure because Jesus endured for us. 1 Peter says that when we suffer, we should do it with a spirit of joy, with an attitude of joy, knowing that we join in the suffering of our Savior. In the same way, Romans 5, 4, Paul writes, we must boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. So suffering can actually build our character, build our spiritual strength. You see, I believe there's power when we endure, not in our strength, but in His strength. And maybe you don't see how it's all going to work out. Maybe you don't know if you can make it much longer. But can I encourage you today to endure, to hold fast, to wait on the deliverance of our God. 
Because I believe when you hold on to God, God is holding on to you. And that you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know all the right things to say. You don't have to be able to quote a bunch of scripture. But can you hold on? Can you outlast it with your faith? Can you endure? Can you bear it with the Lord's strength just a little while longer? Because third and finally, we see the reason. The reason why we can endure in suffering circumstances is because God does see and know what we're going through. After telling us to endure and bear the yoke, the writer of Lamentations then shares these conclusions as we look together at verses 31 through 36, our main text for today. He says, For men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Although he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. To crush underfoot all prisoners of the land, to deny a man his rights before the Most High, to deprive a person of justice, does the Lord not see it? So some important conclusions that I want to bring to our attention this morning from these final verses. Number one, we see that trouble doesn't last always. That suffering is a temporary thing because God's love is unfailing. Even if the Lord brings punishment, it does not last forever. There will be an end. There will come a rescue and a resolution. God in his unfailing love is overcome with compassion even when he is angered at our sin. The Bible says that God's anger lasts but for a moment, but his love endures forever. In the midst of our season of suffering, although we may come to doubt it, maybe even question it, we must hold firm to the overwhelming, resounding message of the Bible all the way through that God is love, that God loves us. And if a man who had experienced the things that the writer of Lamentations experienced, if he could conclude that through it all, through all he's been through, that God is still a compassionate God, a God of unfailing love, then folks, that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me to stand on when I go through my own test and my own trial. Trouble won't last always. Number two, we read that God does not willingly orchestrate or inflict suffering, pain, or grief on his children. That's not how God operates. There are times when God in his sovereignty in his control, is able to allow or permit things to happen that are not necessarily an act of God's will nor God's desire that we should go through. I know that's hard for us to understand, but there are times when God can allow things to happen even if it's not his desire, even if it's not his design. We have to look no further than the garden. When God said, it's not my will that you would eat of this, the fruit of this tree. In fact, I forbid it. I've told you not to do it. But God in his sovereignty allowed humans to have free will, to choose to obey or disobey. And because Adam and Eve disobeyed, sin entered the world. God is in control, but there's still free will. God is sovereign, but there's still things that happen that are of evil in our world. But the good news is that God can use even the season of suffering for his plan. That God can work all things together for our good, even the things that he didn't orchestrate or ordain for our lives. That God can take what the enemy has destined for evil and turn it around and use it for his good. So trouble won't last always. God doesn't willingly inflict us. And finally, the writer concludes with this rhetorical question, does God not see it? When there is violence, when human rights are denied, when there is a miscarriage of justice, doesn't God see it? Well, the answer to that question is that yes. Yes, God sees it. God knows about it. God cares about those in suffering situations. The Christian mystic Julian of Norwich she once wrote, God is the author of all that is good, 
and God suffers from all that is evil. God is present in suffering. He identifies with the weak and the broken. He is the hope of all who endure. He is the strength of all who survive. He is the anchor in the storms of life. God knows what it is to suffer because He came to us in the flesh as a lowly human being who was tempted and tried in every way that we are. He didn't come to us in great power, but He came to us like a lamb led before the slaughter. God looked on His own Son, denied justice, beaten and bloodied and agonizing in pain, and God heard the suffering servant cry out, My God, why have you forsaken me? God sees it. God knows about it. And God cares about all who go through suffering circumstances. And the same God who transformed the agony of the cross into the ecstasy of the empty tomb will transform our seasons of suffering in due time. The witness of the Bible is that God will restore that which the swarming locust has eaten. He will redeem your wasted years. The witness of the Bible is that those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy that sorrow may last for a night, but joy will come in the morning. You see, we struggle with God when we go through seasons of suffering because in our linear notion of time, we often don't see God acting as fast as we'd like. And that's what it came down to for the writer of Lamentations. God, why is this taking so long? Why is this going on longer than I think it should go on? And I'm reminded of that image that uh, was written in a book that I read a few years ago, that our perspective on life is like looking through a hole in a fence. We see a limited scope, a narrow perspective. But God sees everything on the other side of the fence. God sees the expanse of eternity. And so as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice, toward righteousness, toward love. In other words, we may not see God take action to set things right as quickly as we'd like Him to. We may not even see it in our lifetime. We may not see the hand of the Lord intervene right here and now. We may not understand why suffering has to last, why it has to linger. But when we read our Bible, we know that God delivered and restored every single person who had to suffer in the Bible. We read last Sunday how God heard the cries of His people when they were enslaved in Egypt. God delivered them in due season. We, we know that God saw His people wandering in the wilderness and He brought them to the promised land in due season. We know that the prophets were persecuted and Jesus was crucified and the apostles were martyred for their belief in the gospel. But the church still grew and the mission is still alive on earth. We know that God's people do not have an easy road. And that's why we must hold on to faith when God's justice, God's action, God's intervention takes longer than we can ever see in our limited scope. And I think that's exactly why it's called faith. The book of Hebrews says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When you can clearly see all the pieces of the puzzle fitting together, when you have all the answers, when you have the perfect blueprints, it doesn't take any faith. But when you can't see it, when you can't understand it or comprehend it, that's when you have to walk by faith. And I believe that's what the writer of Lamentations would have us to take away from his poetry this morning. I believe he would want us to take away the understanding that faith operates in the midst of the struggle. Faith is your anchor when you are bouncing back and forth between hope and despair. Faith is your lifeline to God, even when you sometimes have to ask, Lord, don't you see it? Don't you know? Don't you care? Jesus would tell a parable in the Gospel of Luke about a woman 
who was denied justice by an unjust judge. And no matter the judge's verdict, no matter how much the judge tried to quiet her and shut her up, she would not be silent. She kept on time after time crying out for justice. And finally, in exasperation, the judge relents and he grants the verdict that she wants. Sometimes faith is having the guts to keep on crying out to God, even, in your, even if you're not sure that he hears you. I want to acknowledge today that I come to the conclusions of this sermon having read and studied this passage having prayed for divine guidance but I must also acknowledge that I've not had many of the experiences that you all have had there are more than just a few people in our church who have had to bury a child and lay their child in the grave there's more than just a few of you who've lost a loved one to cancer some of you have fought that battle yourself and you've come through it you've won some of you are fighting for your life even now. Some of you have lost loved ones to a battle with addiction. Some of you fight that battle and fight that good fight every single day to stay clean and sober. Some of you have lost loved ones to suicide. And some of you struggle with depression. Some of you know what it is to fight for your marriage only to see it end in an ugly divorce. Some of you know that you don't have to look very far to find someone close to you who has been through a season of suffering. And that pain disorients us. It throws us for a loop. It can crush our spirit. It can reduce our faith to a pile of rubble. And I don't pretend to know what it's like to go through your suffering situation or what it is to stand in your shoes. But I do know somewhere in the depths of my soul that God sees your situation, that God is present with you even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and that God wants to redeem whatever injustice life has brought your way. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead wants to resurrect your suffering situation and transform your pain into a newfound purpose. If that's you today, then I would invite you to bring all of that to the altar, to lay all of that at the feet of Jesus this morning, the one who suffered and died and lives and reigns to redeem my life and yours. I hope you'll give to him your questions, your struggles, your pain, because I know and I trust that God will take care of you. That's our hymn of invitation as we stand together to sing and to respond to God as the Spirit would lead. I invite you to come as you feel led to worship at this altar. I'll be down front to pray if you need prayer. And just a word of procedure this morning. We're going to sing all the verses of God will take care of you. And when we have sung all the verses in the last chorus, if there are still people coming to the altar, still worshiping, if you would just take your seat right where you are, as Lauren will direct you, and if you would just be in prayer for those people uh, whom God is ministering to at the altar during that time, let's stand as we respond to God. Hymn number 64, God will take care of you.
Would you stand for our benediction? I hope you'll join us tonight at 7 o'clock for the men of faith. I know you will be blessed by that. It'll be a great time of worship. Hope you can come back. Remember to keep our youth group in your prayers as they are traveling back. They'll be back this afternoon. Let's bow for our benediction. Lord, we leave this place enveloped in your love having felt the Spirit of the Most High God touch us, Lord, in our humble condition. Lord, I pray that as we go forth from this place into a new week, into a broken world, that, Lord, you will use us to be your witnesses in all the earth. That, Lord, we will take the truth, the hope, the faith that has been uh, uplifted in us and rooted in us, and that, Lord, we might use it to bless others. In the name of Jesus, amen.